Well, welcome everyone. It's it's a joy to see you. I'm Maureen O'Brien, and uh, with Chuck Chesnavage, we are, are co-moderating um, um, this session of the Catholic Community of Practice for Religious Education Association. So in a minute, I uh, will put up this, the shared screen again for the slideshow, but uh, we want to see all your faces a little bit in the gallery here. Uh, as we get started, uh, and we did get a, a very nice response of uh, participants, and so uh, that is great. This has been a group that is longstanding within REA, and we vary in what we do. We don't uh, we don't make this a high pressure sort of group, but we do like to have some kind of focus for conversation. And we think we have a, a nice opportunity in a couple different ways this evening for what we're going to be about. Um, we do uh, like to start with introductions. And so we wanna make the introductions brief to allow us to have um, maximum time with our presenter, Dr. Rito Baring and his colleague, Dr. Jeremy Molino, uh, for the first part of the session. And then we're going to do what we hope will be uh, an engaging a segment of, of synodal conversation uh, in the spirit of the synod for a synodal church to surface some priorities for us as Catholic religious educators for the second part of our session. So we'll say more about all that as we go along. But uh, for right now, let's just do some very brief introductions. Uh, please introduce yourself with your name as you would like to be called in the session and uh, tell us where you're from. And that's pretty much all we have time for. You'll have a little bit more time as, as the session goes on and perhaps in the breakout rooms. And I was thinking that if it's okay uh, for Mary as tech host, if people wanna stay on at the end of the session, is it okay to leave the Zoom room open and if people wanna have some chatting time, social time at the end, we can do that as well. So, but for right now, um, I think what I'll do uh, in terms of the having the screen is I'll just call on people by the name that I see on the screen and please correct me if I mispronounce, uh, but, uh, but please then do introduce yourself by the name you'd like to be called and tell us um, who you are and where you're from, uh, and, uh, and we'll take it from there. Uh, if you wanna name an institution that you're part of uh, as well, that would be absolutely great. So, um, so I'm Maureen O'Brien and uh, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, United States, uh, very recently retired from Duquesne University uh, in Pittsburgh, PA. Um, Thomas Groom. Thank you, Maureen. I'm Tom Groom. I've been working at Boston College for a while, and uh, I'm starting a sabbatical this year, which is a lot of fun, and uh, don't quite know what to do with it, but we'll find something, or something will find me, I hope. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Chuck Chesnavage. Hi, everybody. Uh, Chuck Chesnavich here in my home in Yonkers, New York. I am currently an adjunct professor at Mercy College, primarily teaching world religions, and also at uh, UTS, which was formerly Unification Theological uh, Seminary and has been renamed HK uh, Institute for Peace Studies, so it has received a new name. Those are my places where I currently teach. Also, still involved in union work with the adjunct union at Mercy College. Thank you. Sure. Noel Shul. Hi, everybody. I'm Noel Shul in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, retired from Memorial University of Newfoundland. And here it's uh, 10 minutes to 11 at night on Monday night. So I'm curious what time it is where you are. <laughs> Eileen Daly. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> yeah, I am Eileen Daly. I now live in Old Orchard Beach, Maine, which is once or Abenaki territory. Um, I retired from Boston University as an administrator in August, but <laughs> I'm teaching in the fall. <laughs> But I'm teaching online, so I can walk the beach every day anyway. Um, and uh, 
And if anybody wants to talk about possibly making AI a theme for two years out from now, talk to me. I'm I'm considering it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Rito Baring. Hi, good morning, everybody. Greetings from Manila. <laughs> this is my first uh, formal uh, uh, opportunity to join the conference since I joined in 2009, I think. So I'm from Manila and uh, nice to meet everybody. Okay, we'll hear more from Rita soon. Carl. Hi, everyone. Carl Picario Foley. I'm from New Rochelle, New York, and I, I serve as the executive director of Marindale Center, a retreat and spirituality center up in Ossining. And I also um, adjunct at Iona University here in New Rochelle. It's good to be with everyone tonight. Israel Diaz. Oh, hi, I'm Israel Diaz. I'm currently now in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm working as a senior instructional designer at Kenner School of Theology at Emory University. And I'm also an adjunct at LIM in Loyola, New Orleans. Thank you. Tina Drakeford. Hi, my name is Tina Drakeford. Um, I am a PhD student at the St. Michael's College in the Toronto School of Theology in the University of Toronto, um, Canada. And it's 9.25 here in the evening. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got. Um, I, I, my, one of the members of my committee is, um, oh my goodness, I forgot her last name, Cindy. Cindy, uh -huh. who I think knows Thomas Groom, and his last name I've just forgotten. Cameron. Uh, Cameron, sorry. <laughs> Cindy Cameron. And she's the one who suggested this conference, and I, I was looking through the, the list of things to attend, and this seemed interesting, but I'm not really sure what I know yet. So, um, hi everyone. Yeah. Hosman Espino. Thank you, Maureen Hosman. And I live uh, in the Boston area and I'm a professor at Boston College School of Theology and Ministry and we will miss Tom next year on his sabbatical. Thanks, Hosman. Monique Van Dijk. Yes, hello everyone. I'm Monique van Dijk from the Netherlands. I'm a professor of religious education at Tilburg University, uh, so uh, School of Catholic Theology there. Nice to meet you and great to see you back again, Maureen. Wonderful, mm -hmm. we miss you. Uh, Thanks, Monique. Mm -hmm. What time is it there? Well, actually, I'm in uh, at the United States right now, so that's good. Otherwise, it would be in the middle of the night, uh, about three o'clock. So I'm very happy that I made the trip. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Uh, Harold Harrell. Hello, everyone. I'm Bud Harrell, and I teach at, in New York City at the Fordham University Graduate School of Religion and Religious Education. Thanks, Bud. Jeremy Molina. Hello, everyone. Good morning from the Philippines. So I am currently teaching the Christian faith education in the undergrad and religious studies in the graduate school. Uh, likewise, I am the head of religion department here from St. Louis University, Baguio City, Philippines. Nice to meet you, everyone. Hmm. Chris Miller. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Miller. I uh, am out in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's about 630 here. I currently teach at a LaSalle and Christian Brothers uh, High School, teach uh, 10th, 11th grade religious studies. And I'm probably the uh, world's longest grad student, having been enrolled in grad school for 19 years now <laughs> and continuing. But that does include a, a doctoral degree in education, four masters, and a couple certificates, including a certificate at Boston College in spirituality, which I'll be uh, there in Boston in, in next week, actually. So uh, very excited to be here. Okay, Chris. Hey, Chris. <laughs> Paulus Echo Cristianto. Okay, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paulus Echo Cristianto. I'm a doctoral student of religious education at Tutawacana Christian University, uh, Indonesia. 
with the professor, uh, super, my supervisors is uh, Professor Tabita Christiani. Uh, Prof. Tabita is uh, Prof. Thomas Groom's student, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, thank That's you. That's wonderful. That's, you're a second generation. That's wonderful. Yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, second generation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Paulus. Alfred Pang coming. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. I'm calling in from Singapore. Um, good to see very familiar faces here from Boston College, uh, where I graduated with my PhD in theology and education. Uh, we are here in the morning. Uh, I'm currently an adjunct lecturer at a teacher's training college. Uh, we call it National Institute of Education here. And I'm actually teaching uh, leadership and ethics in education. Um, I also part-time teach this coming semester at the National University of Singapore, uh, and it's in the field of community leadership. Um, so I'm just crossing several fields, but happy to be back here with religious educators and theologians. So good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, Alfred. Welcome home. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Robert McInnes. Hey, good evening, everyone. How are you? everyone as well. Um, I'm calling from New York uh, City. Uh, Bob, it's my first time as a part of um, the, uh, the, the sessions for today. And um, I'm coming from City Seminary of uh, New York City, where we are working and learning with educators in, on behalf of children and children education. And um, um, so I'm sort of new as a new educator as well. And um, I'm just looking to learn and glean and be a part of um, what's going on here. So I'm just, I don't know what to say. I'm just happy to be a part. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. All right, Remigius Nwabichi, and I'm a uh, Konkwo Nwabichi. Remedius, can you hear us? To you. Diane Oliveros? Can you hear us, Diane? Hi, yes, yes. Hello. We're just doing introductions. Okay. Oh. Just, uh, you, oh. Um, there she is. We're just uh, giving our names and where we're from. Hi, so I'm, I'm Diane. I'm a student at Boston College in the PhD in Theology and Education program. I'm from the Philippines. So, Welcome. Uh, Remigius, uh, can you uh, uh, hear us and just give your name and where you're from, please? And uh, unmute, please. We, uh, can you unmute Remigius? Oh, I'm sorry, we still can't hear you. Perhaps you could uh, Put uh, put your information in the chat or be a volume issue there. And how about uh, Mary Hess? Yeah, so I'm Mary Hess. I'm professor of educational leadership at Luther Seminary, which is in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I'm your outgoing, trying to retire REA networking coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> Three cheers and many more <laughs> for much service. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you all. I think I got everyone. And um, let us move on. I'm going to turn it over to Chuck to introduce our presentation. Thank you. 
And I will ask that you um, mute your yourself when you are not speaking, and we'll go from here. Okay, thank you. Um, you may have seen in the Catholic Community Practice newsletter or a letter we sent out announcing this that we had invited um, Rito and Jeremy to be joining us tonight. Um, Rito uh, was participating in the Greening the Faith uh, Challenge to RE conference that took place in the Philippines. And so it seemed like a good opportunity for him to share some of the things that came out of that conference. Uh, Rito Baring is a professor of the Department of Theology and Religious Education at De La Salle University in Manila. He served as, as, his, as its former chair for seven years. He took his doctorate in religious education from the same university. And his research interests include religious education, empirical studies and theology, survey research, youth studies, and assessment. Uh, Jeremy Molina is a professor of the Religion Department of St. Louis University in Baguay City in northern Philippines. She earned her PhD in Applied Theology at De La Salle University in 2021. She's also interested in empirical studies and theology and the environment as well as youth studies. So we welcome uh, both of them to today's session. Mm -hmm. And uh, the time frame, again, uh, Maureen, would be approximately uh, 20 minutes of their sharing, 10 minutes for Q&A afterwards, okay? And uh, Rito, uh, I'll give you a heads up. I'll give you both a heads up after 15 minutes, just to let you know there's five minutes left, okay? okay thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Maureen. Yes. Um, sure. The floor is yours. The floor is both of yours. Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, uh, I'm deeply uh, honored and very appreciative of the opportunity given to me uh, because this is my first time, as I said earlier, to join uh, one of RE, uh, REA sessions uh, for the conference. So since, uh, and of course, uh, I am immensely grateful because uh, uh, the organizers, uh, Chuck and Maureen, uh, allowed me to share the time, this opportunity, uh, even to the extent of uh, adjusting uh, the time to accommodate us. So, so what I will present is, uh, uh, the, I don't know if I can share, I hope my connection is not compromised if I share the PowerPoint. We can see it. It's okay. Yes. It's good. Okay. So I included in this uh, in this meeting my colleague and a recent graduate from our PhD program in De La Salle University, uh, Dr. Jeremy Molina. And um, I also would like to thank those who have attended uh, our recent virtual national conference. So this report will include a brief description of my research engagements, brief introduction of the Philippine context of religious education, our recent study on youth Christian environmentalism uh, that led to an articulation of a Filipino youth-specific eco-theological view or model. The last part will be about the recently concluded hybrid 11th National Conference in Catechesis and Religious Education, uh, last June 23 to 24 at De La Salle University. Um, this also to include in my desire uh, to see more collaborations and perhaps engagements between Filipino religious educators uh, in research and the other side of the globe. My research engagements, 
my interest in empirical studies, uh, particularly in the formation of human attitudes, uh, led me to a different appreciation of religious education, theology, and youth studies. Religious education is deeply interested in attitude and values formation. And for me, theology's enduring appeal rests in its ability to communicate and critique the values preached by Jesus. By looking at the unfinished or unexplored questions re relating to the Filipino youth mindset vis-a-vis -vis the Christian imagination, I realized how big the work ahead is for us in the Philippines. Uh, with this in my mind, uh, it has become my personal mission to encourage other religious educators here to do research in their schools. And it has become my personal advocacy here to inspire and encourage fellow religious educators to engage in research activities. Doing religious education research in our country means that we put an eye towards the increasing state of religious and cultural diversity in our country, which adds more challenges to our doing religious education in our country. The Catholic Church maintains good relations with other religions and inter-religious dialogue is moving well in, in southern regions, especially in Mindanao, between local faith-based organizations. However, there is limited engagement in inter-religious dialogue within the school setting, perhaps due to due in part to the confessional nature of religious education in the country. In addition to that, the changing political landscape here created more gaps and conflict between the government and religious institutions, especially the Philippine Church. The Philippine Church, which we, uh, which we discussed in another work uh, on the state of separation between church and state, uh, around the recently concluded uh, Rodrigo Duterte administration. And lastly, my preoccupation with uh, reviewing Filipino youth religious attitudes and worldviews led me to see uh, transitions in the religious contours of young people's religious insights about religious faith, environment, and even the sacred. While young Filipinos uh, show signs of uh, loosening the gap, the grip on traditional religious practice, their sense of institutional affiliation, their religious worldviews, and spiritual appreciation of life remain. The sense and belief uh, in God remains strong as well. Overall, there is a transition, however, in the religious worldviews of young Filipinos. From recent reports, uh, an estimated 60 to 70 of young Filipinos today still declare religious affiliation and show religiously favorable appreciation of faith, religion, and even the environment. It seems that the Filipino exposure to an increasingly secular environment and modernized mindset has not replaced entirely youth religious behavior and uh, get the religious imagination. In a comparative study we did uh, on student religiosity between private and public universities in Manila and neighboring provinces, it was remarkable to note how students from government institutions maintain significant religious behaviors, sometimes outsmarting those in Catholic schools. Now, in the current Philippine context, in Southeast Asia today, the Philippines and Timor-Leste are the only two countries with majority in the population being Roman Catholics. The recent presidential election appeared to us to be a test of religion's commitment to truth-telling in public spaces. A year ago, our country held the most controversial presidential elections 
there is a circulating perception that the electronic result was rigged. The claim is supported by reports of foreign observers observed in the recent electoral proceedings. Recently, this uh, public impression is sustained by three individuals who came out to challenge the results by requesting the Supreme Court to order the Commission on Elections to produce the actual transmission logs with their official servers. The Commission on Election could not produce the official transmission logs and instead gave a different record, giving the petitioners reason to doubt the integrity of the election results. Another glaring issue was that the servers were fed with data from different individual unofficial illegal IP addresses. The unresolved uh, doubts about the integrity of election remain until now. This situation has implications in our Catholic discourse. As far as uh, education is concerned, the Philippine education system is serviced by private and public schools. Private schools, mostly Catholic schools, uh, service only about 20% of the total student population, thus leaving students under the care of government institutions, which do not include a Christian curriculum. Religious education and the basic ed curriculum is largely uh, leaning towards catechesis or faith-based instruction. In higher education institutions like our institution, we provide theological inputs. And in our classes, however, uh, however, in government uh, regulations do not, uh, do not include religious courses in the government mandated higher education curriculum. Since universities are given some leeway to to offer courses in addition to mandated courses, the only way for religious and theology courses to be taught is when these universities offer them in their curriculum. Our work on Christian environmentalism. Prior to the pandemic, we started work on college students' attitudes towards the environment. I shared this passion with my research collaborator, uh, Dr. Jeremy Molino, since I wa it was an empirical study, we also did a survey of college students from four universities in, in Northern Philippines. At first, uh, we tested a model of student worldviews on the environment, which included the following aspects. We included anthropocentric frames, geocentric, ecocentric, and uh, theocentric aspects towards the world. That model was uh, rejected uh, through quantitative analysis, and we came up with a more robust model, which I, it happened uh, to be made up of mostly theocentric views. That to me is a surprise since we were only trying to unveil uh, the attitudes of students towards ecology and nature. So to see a theologically, uh, specifically theocentric uh, mod model uh, as their ecological view is something we did not really expect. Uh, the following items comprise the unidimensional Christian environmentalism model of Filipino students. You will notice that there are 15 items in that uh, unidimensional uh, model. Uh, what I did, what we did was to uh, just simply review the content. And uh, we found out that uh, the content itself, though you need dimensional, uh, contains significant uh, aspects, namely uh, creator, creation, uh, and the goodness of creation and nature and human responsibility. But you will notice that these items are uh, theocentrically oriented. No? Uh, recognizing God's place in nature, in creation. Again, I, as I've said, this is part of our surprise because we only intended 
to check or to assess how students would look at the world and nature. And we ended up with this kind of model. Uh, so that led us to discern behind this unique uh, youth eco-theological view okay, uh, as a natural ecological expression of the world. Filipino youth eco-theological appreciation of nature then uh, labeled by Jeremy as kalikhasang balaan. Hope you, you can <laughs> follow the word. Uh, that's our Filipino word, kalikhasang balaan. The word is a rich mix of uh, several concepts in one, uh, which in English might be casually translated as created sacred nature subject of human responsibility, something like that. But the first word is a mix of kalikasan, which means nature, and likha, which means create, and introduced by a prefix ka, indicating a relationship. So in, for Filipinos, the word ka is, a, is an indication of a relationship. So it is then ka plus likha plus kalikasan. And then the word balaan uh, means sacred. So that actually uh, describes the whole uh, view towards nature, the sanctity of nature. Again, uh, again this is a surprise result uh, because we did not intend that to be, no? Uh, the explanation uh, behind the concept is part of a recent publication uh, which we had in the journal Religions. Uh, I, I can share the, a copy of that if you are interested. That's open access, by the way. Uh, right now, we are currently developing a thesis behind Kalikasang Balaan to show its post-colonial undertones. And hopefully, we can finish that. Now, uh, so Jeremy it's a talk... 15 minutes, Rito, just to let you know, okay? Ah, okay, okay, sorry. That's so okay. anyway, that's about the Kalikasan, but let me skip to the last part, the 11th uh, National Conference. Okay. So last June 23 to 24, our department con convened the hybrid 11th National Conference in Catechesis at De La Salle University, Manila. Now with the theme, uh, Greening the Faith and Challenges for Religious Education. We had about 120 online and in-person participants, and uh, we had invited uh, four plenary speakers for that. So the first uh, presentation was about uh, the proper understanding of anthropocentrism, uh, supported by papal pronouncements. And uh, the second one was, was presented by Jeremy, on uh, uh, the youth eco-theological model. And the third one was on uh, utopia as a model for religious imagination to build up uh, on a, a, a good uh, ecological imagination for healing. And then the last one was about a, an actual case uh, of a community engaged in environmental uh, efforts. So overall we have had um, uh, 30, 30 papers presented in eight panels. Basically, uh, the first panel is about religious education environment, it's followed by the second on church and environment, and the next is on curriculum and environment, and the fourth is on eco spiritualities and religious education, and the fifth is on gender, culture, ecology, and RE. And the sixth is prospects for our engagements in climate emergency. And the seventh is concept and practice of care for creation. And the last is uh, laudato si and implications for RE. So overall, the conference participants had a good appreciation of the issues that are of interest to religious education practice in the country. Ecological justice is everybody's concern. Uh, from the curriculum to the classroom, there remains a lot of things to be done to join the voices of uh, varied groups, now including the young, to claim ownership over the widespread human abuse and more collaboratively towards our common goal of ecological healing. I think that's all. And uh, thank you for listening and good morning.
Thank you, Rito. You had a little bit more time to spare if you wanted it. We're approaching 18 minutes, but that leads into any type of uh, Q&A we may have. Um, I'll start, first of all, by saying uh, you may have heard we have had the hottest day on the face of the earth, the hottest temperature days. It's been quite literally hotter than hell in some ways. Uh, so globally, we've reached that that heat mark for days. And the climate change has led to variables that can be catastrophic from the terrible uh, hurricanes in Guam, the island of Guam, to um, recent flash floods here in New York that have taken out roads to extreme heat in Texas and other parts. And, and it's happening globally. So. Um, we had the fires in Canada, drifting smoke down here that made the air quality very poor in a large part of the Northeast. And so the close connection we all have with, with nature and the environment is becoming stronger and stronger. What type of specific issues of climate change have impacted the Philippines and brought attention to, to you in that part of the world? The most notable among them is a uh, change of weather. So right now our summer has changed into sometimes rainy season. <laughs> so there is a, a lot of rain uh, taking place on, let's say, I think uh, that's April and May. So it used to be summertime. So we have that's dry season, but now it's different. So that whole change of, of season has deeply affected our farmers. So crop, uh, crop production is, is greatly affected. So it, it affected the cycle and uh, the farmers' plans in, in terms of uh, what crop to plant and, and the season to, to, to organize their uh, plantation, plant uh, schedule. So that's one. The other thing is we are also affected in the academe. I mean, our academic schedule has to shift a little bit uh, because let's say, um, it used to be that public schools will open up. Uh, we are semestral for the public schools. Uh, our university is following the trimestral uh, schedule. Uh, so for most of the public schools, they're following the semestral. It, it usually start before at June and then ending up in uh, uh, sometime in December. But because of flooding, what, what they did, it starts in June, July, and even August. What they did was to break it up so that July and August is freed from uh, academic activities and, and, and little children are spared from, from flooding, all of that. So they have to change this, the academic schedule. Uh, so right now, June, July is vacation. It's academic break for most public schools. But of course, uh, in the university, we still follow the trimestral, tri trimestral schedule. So we have the, the, we are on the third term right now, which ends up in August. So that's it. Uh, what else? Hot, yeah. It's really hot here in the Philippines. When you say hot, uh, it's like having convulsion and, and extreme hot, uh, hot fever. <laughs> that's very abnormal. No? Mm. Uh, mm. But I, I'm just uh, wondering why the, the data in terms of, uh, I mean, skin-related issues due to the hot weather condition is not as high. I'm not sure if it's not just reported, but really it's hot. It's really hot. So we can reach yeah. up, uh, up to, let's say, I think the last one is 50. Uh, that's degree centigrade, uh, not Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Degree centigrade. So that's quite hot already. I mean... Uh, Fever is about only 38, but now it is going beyond 40, 45, 48. Mm. And it has mm. become very normal. Well, and maybe well, thank it's going you. higher. Yeah, thank you for that update from down there. We have three questions, and maybe Alfred, Paulus, and Carl, if you could maybe mention your three questions, and then we'll let Rito and, and Jeremy answer them as they see fit. So, uh, Alfred, you want to go first, ask your question and comment, and then we'll have Paulus and Carl ask them as follow up. Yeah. Hi, Rito. Um, thank you for sharing your research. I'm in Singapore. I can understand the terribly hot weather in this part of the world as well. Um, no, I just wanted to ask, I think you wanted to say something more about how you and Jeremy intend to develop the research that you did. So I wanted to hear more from you. Uh, 
where do you go from here? Um, and, and you wanted to say something along the line of a connection with post-colonial theology. I'm interested in that link or the connection you're trying to make. If you can just elaborate more. Thank you. Can you remember uh, that, Rito? Because let me get Carl and, and Israel. Carl, Israel, and, and Paulus. Paulus, Carl, do you want to repeat your questions? Or put them in the chat as well, but repeat them first. Paulus, do you want to state your question? Okay, thank, yeah, okay. thank you for this opportunity and thank you for your presentation, uh, Dr. Rituko. And I understand, uh, same like, uh, Dr. Alfred, uh, I understand about the situation of Asia and Philippine, Filipino and Indonesia is also Asia. But my my question is, uh, why do you use, uh, why you don't use about uh, the connecting it, the situation of Filipino, especially in ecological issues with uh, religious education and spirituality? Because uh, I think that when you tell to us about uh, using the culture or the situation of Filipino, I think we can build we can uh, build it and combine about the combined religious education and uh, spirituality. So uh, maybe like uh, spirituality of local culture in Filipino. Thank you. Okay, uh, Carl. No, my question, and thank you, Rito. My question would be, um, of the, the young people that you you interviewed and uh, who are climate activists or who are engaged in the climate um, issues, do you feel as if they're, they're learning, they're being informed more by the academy, informed by the church, informed by secular activism? Uh, or what? What is what is really what is what is their resource? And then I just wanted to ask about this topic of of um, climate anxiety, whether climate anxiety and young people is is something that 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 inhibits young people in the Philippines. Israel, do you want to ask yours? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rita, for all this uh, information. I am curious because you mentioned how, despite increase in secularism. There's still interest among youth of some kind of religious affiliation or religion. And then it seems that a theocentric approach grabbed their attention more in terms of being engaged in the environment. So I'm wondering if there's any of the research that you did that could explain as to why, despite secularism, there's still an interest in theocentric uh, beliefs. And why is theocentric beliefs the one that really grabs their attention? Uh, for being engaged in the environment. Okay, Rito, there's a lot on the plate for you and Jeremy. You could handle them as you see fit from the colonialism to climate anxiety to um, what's motivating the theocentric viewpoint. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, the first one on post-colonial uh, undertones. Actually, I, I, I became interested in that because uh, prior to the uh, proposed uh, study, it, it, the study is actually in its early stage. So it's not yet, uh, it has not yet formally begun. I'm just uh, ex uh, trying to play with the concepts and, and to read uh, literature on this regard, on this matter, and how it goes moving forward. But prior to that, I already had. Uh, uh, I did uh, work on, on cultural studies, uh, looking at the Filipino mindset, uh, uh, trying to see how currently the religious viewpoints of the young are shifting. So there is shifting, uh, uh, that's what I observed, no? Uh, the shifts in, in their religious constructs uh, currently. Uh, like, for instance, uh, in the West, we can see that there is already an increased, a significant increase in religious disaffiliation uh, among the young, actually. Uh, but now here in the Philippines, we are still so much affiliated. No? But despite that, yes, there is so much affiliation, but the, the shift is observed. And, and there is a, a, a Philipp, the young Filipinos have found themselves a way to reappropriate religious notions and ideas. And how they live it, no? 
the concept of lived religion, I, I, I to a certain extent may have uh, may estimate the kind of idea, no? but not exactly it. But uh, yes, uh, that's why the the idea of uh, working on Kalikasang Balaan's post-colonial undertones is of interest to me because uh, I have seen how uh, uh, this, this model, for instance, is uh, reflecting uh, some elements of a post-colonial um, post insights, which I wish to develop further. No? So, But uh, I have not yet uh, done so much work on it, so I'm still in the early stage of exploring uh, how to go about with it. Okay. So, but maybe I can share with you uh, once I'm done, we are done with that. You know? And then the other thing about, I think about spirituality and RE. Yeah, as, uh, Filipino spirituality is deeply intertwined with their being religious, with their religious mindset. So that's why uh, I would say that uh, as far as our context is concerned, there is a, an intertwining of religiosity and spirituality, not, not so much distinguished uh, from each other because uh, in some works it is distinguished. No? Spirituality is differentiated from religiosity. Uh, but in our case, it is uh, intertwined, interlocked. And uh, being so, uh, Filipinos easily look at the world uh, from a very religious point of view. No, spiritualized, religious, that kind of thing. So to bring that, I mean, this model that we have worked on is, is something that's very significant for religious education. That's why uh, also recently uh, Jeremy did work on uh, finding the relevance of, uh, of the model, Kalikasang Balaan, in religious education. And then um, next is about the question about whether the inspiration, uh, the theocentric inspiration is really something that's influenced by the church or by the school or the, by the university. Uh, we did not, we have not uh, explored that matter exactly, but I can only surprise, uh, surmise or, or uh, maybe speculate that uh, the influence has, um, Partly is are partly part of the cultural orientation, the religious orientation of Filipinos, and the other one is the family influence. Family influence. Uh, we still maintain that good uh, family uh, relationships, no. And uh, as you will notice, uh, I mean, Filipino families are bonded together usually, and the religious orientation is maintained. <laughs> So that kind of uh, environment, I suppose, is influencing them. Because I, I honestly, it's really a surprise to us, no? We wanted to, to came, come up with a model, just like the developmental models develop in the West, no? On, on environmental, uh, environmentalism. But we ended up with this kind of uh, very religious model. And uh, it, it made me, uh, I mean, wondering. And this is an eco-theological uh, point, no? And that's specifically for the young, by the way, because uh, this is our first attempt to articulate a, a model for the youth, no? Uh, young people, but not for the adults. I don't know how the adults are looking at, uh, because you see, uh, uh, since the, the, the issue of Lynn White Jr., no? the, the accusation of anthropocentrism, which is an adult-centered uh, mindset or worldview, I don't know if that is shared here in the Philippines, I mean, anthropocentric view, but definitely we, uh, the young ones, they are not looking at that perspective. Mm. So I think that's, that's my uh, take on the questions. There, there's some in the chat, if you just want to look at the chat, um, Rito, if you want to look in the chat, they put some of the questions in the chat of basically you, you have touched on the ones that were asked. Um, if there's anything you missed in looking at each one in the chat, I think you did cover just about all of them. If anybody needs oh. follow up.
I'm just wondering what the uh, place of Laudato Si is in all of this, whether it's a central document or uh, it kind of followed along and uh, it, it fit in with uh, your findings. Anyway, uh, I, thanks for your presentation, it was very good. But I, I am curious about this role of uh, papal. Yeah, we, we tried to actually integrate the insights of Laudato Si and of course even the insights of Pope uh, Benedict. Uh, uh, in our recent article on uh, Kalikasang Balaan, uh, uh, because uh, their insights actually support our, uh, our the model itself actually. Uh, you see, uh, this is a theocentric model which recognizes uh, the world as created, no? not just uh, an indifferent uh, object, or but rather something that's created. So the, the relationality is uh, emphasized here. No? So uh, young students look at the connection between them and nature, uh, which is quite distinct from the, the usual ecocentric sense because you see in ecocentric this in the independence and, and the life of nature itself is also highlighted but uh, what we are looking at is the emphasis on the relationality that uh, the, the the young students young people look at themselves in relation to nature and and claim that sense of responsibility that's the point no? the responsibility so and i think that's at least that's that's good news, you know, reason for us to be optimistic about uh, having heard about the, the in recent initiatives of young people around the world, you know, especially like the, the Friday movement. And of course, in the Philippines, we have also uh, uh, young initiated uh, movements uh, on environment. Uh, however, wh what we need to see more engagements is from the young people in the church. That is what we need to see, more engagements. But uh, young people who are not connected with the church, there are some organized activities, but not within the church, within, within the Catholic church. That's what we want to see. No? I think that's not quite uh, visible, observable. If there are any young engagements that is usually under the influence of uh, leaders like the basic ecclesial community leaders, uh, local church leaders, but not an initiative that's really coming from them. Okay. There's a, a request. Uh, there's a request to put a citation for any of your articles in the chat, if, if they're possible to be found, if you have any citations for the articles related to your research. And maybe in, the, in just the final few minutes, uh, Dr. Molina, do you want to add anything to what's been said already? Uh, yeah, actually, it uh, it has been said, and uh, I'm I'm just taking all the questions and thoughts that you are sharing in this uh, forum, so we can consider and explore more uh, of our studies, uh, particularly. Um, taking a place, uh, the role of the Laudato Si in the study. So these are all exploration, still uh, it's best. Thank you so much for your meaningful questions. Sure, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for that presentation and reminding us how interconnected we are, how small the world is, what happens in one part of the world is happening in another part of the world in some way, shape or form. And we are living on a very fragile planet. Um, so we're going to make a shift gears. Uh, let's thank um, Rito and Jeremy for joining us for this part of the presentation of the Catholic Community of Practice. We're going to be shifting gears now and moving towards uh, some discussion on another global topic, which is the Synod and Synodal. synodal. Uh, so uh, Maureen, do you want to um, take over for the second part? Okay, well, let me add my thanks to um, to Rito and to Jeremy very much for that very, very helpful and uh, presentation and giving us lots to think about on many levels. So thank you again, and for the questions as well. 
So yeah, to, to shift gears, uh, we thought that for a session um, for the Catholic community of practice, it would be meaningful at least to raise and to practice a bit um, a, a synodal process uh, relative to the synod for the, the synodal church that has been going on uh, through uh, the past couple of years and to use it to surface some of our own priorities uh, for Catholic, uh, Catholic religious education, Catholic religious educators. So I invite you to be um, somewhat uh, relaxed and playful with this. Uh, but we will probably not get through all the movements of the process, but, uh, but using it as we can in the time that we have left. So I'm going to um, share my screen, but I'm also going to uh, ask Mary if she would drop, uh, drop the slideshow into the chat, if people are okay with me sharing, uh, sharing this uh, material in the chat um, for your reference as we go. So if uh, no objections to that, I'm going to surface this and share my screen. So I'm going to assume that probably most of you at least heard about um, have heard about the Synod uh, at some point along the way here, and probably that at least some of us have participated in some way in the process uh, since it began in 2021. For our time tonight, uh, Chuck and I thought that it could be somewhat useful to try this, uh, what the, the Synod process used as a spiritual conversation model to help us surface some of our own priorities that we could take into possible future sessions of the Catholic community of practice to help us continue to grow on our own, if you will, synodal journey uh, as, as a community of practice. And so um, we're going to be framing this in terms of a question to use in breakout rooms for a short period of time. And we know we haven't given you any preparation for this, which is normally part of a synodal process, but we also figured that as um, dedicated people in religious education, you probably have some ideas that, uh, that would come to mind for you pretty readily. So um, with the time we have, we're gonna invite you into two short rounds within the breakout rooms. So I'm going to uh, quickly review the, what you can be doing in those two rounds, and then we'll bring you back into a, a quick closing round and take some notes and see what has emerged. But if you um, are aware of the synodal process, you know that it includes an openness to the Holy Spirit, uh, periods of silence, and periods of deep listening. So I'm going to work through what uh, we're calling round one and round two, and then we'll be asking you in the breakout rooms to, um, to work with those processes. Um, I put the link to the very recent document, the Instrumentum Laboris, uh, into the, this slide, and I put the infographic that they used in that document. Uh, it's very small on the screen, but you can easily access it in the link. And then I'm just adapting it in the, the slides. So once you go into the breakout room, I'm going to ask Mary to set these up uh, for no more than five people uh, per breakout room and for 20 minutes. So in round one, the synodal um, documents talk about this as taking the word and listening. So it's listening to what emerges from each one of us in this 10 minute period. So we'll ask that one person uh, volunteer or, or be nominated gently by the group to be the facilitator and that that person um, be responsible to just invite the group into a moment of silence uh, to welcome the spirit's presence. And that after a little bit of silence, that all of us uh, in the group simply respond as you feel moved. Uh, you can pass if you like, but what do you think, what, what is stirred within you as the most important one or two top issues or focus areas that you believe Catholic religious educators are being called to address in the next 10 years? 
in, the, in this next period of our rapidly changing world. And that each person has uh, up to two minutes to share um, their response and the facilitator watching the time. So if you know this, this process, you know that round one, there's no discussion. Um, so everyone is simply listening to what uh, emerges from the individuals, uh, each individual sharing. So that concludes, then there's a, a round two, and the document calls this making space for others and the other, the Holy Spirit. And so again, facilitated as you've listened to what emerged in that round one, what moved within your mind and heart as you listen to others speak. Again, a moment of silent reflection and just a minute per person to respond to what moved in your listening, what moved in your mind and heart in your listening to others. What were the areas of greatest resonance and resistance that arose within you? Where was your heart burning within you as you listened to others? And then if you have any time left, <laughs> um, determine what are the, the top priorities that you would like to bring back to the large group. If you've run out of time, don't worry. We'll just give you a chance to speak um, out of the group uh, uh, in that period. Okay, so um, again, you know, be relaxed about this. It's not meant to be high pressure. Um, the Synod is a journey process. And so um, we'll, uh, we'll ask Mary to uh, send us into the breakout rooms. And Mary, were you able to put the document into the, um, into the chat? Yeah, there's a link in the chat to the document and the invitation to rooms has been issued. Thank you very much. We'll see you in 20 minutes. I couldn't open the document, so hopefully someone can. <laughs> mm. I couldn't open it either. Well, you it was Maureen's document. So did you need to change the permissions, Maureen? It, it, it actually leads to an, an inbox rather than to the document. Ah, OK. Hmm. Hold on. Maybe I did it wrong. Let me see. I can try putting it in again too. Or I can try putting it in. Well, I, yeah, you should try because I guess I don't have permission to share it from here. I could download yeah. it. Let me try doing that. Maybe if you can send it to all the groups. So I just put it in the chat as a PDF. See if that works. That looks like it was working. Yeah, that works. Yep. All right. Thank you. Lido, are you having a hard time getting into the breakout or did you choose not to go to it? Let's be frozen. Right, so uh, that went quickly, I know. 
and thank you for your participation. I, I hope that all of you had as, as uh, wonderful an experience as our breakout room was. Um, as we come to the end of our time, I'm going to ask that rather than any kind of, of extended reports, which we clearly don't have time for, just if, uh, if people, anyone, if you had a designated reporter, they could speak first, but um, just if anyone either wants to put in the chat or just say a phrase that expresses what you heard as a priority emerging from your breakout rooms sharing. And we'll just leave the remaining three minutes um, for that to happen. Chuck is going to take notes. So into the chat or uh, speaking orally or both um, phrase, word, uh, that speaks to a priority that you heard. Again, this might be a priority of yours, but we want it to be something that you heard emerging and being resonated within the time um, that you spent in your synodal sharing. So the floor is open. For, for our group, it was a revolutionary moment, uh, the importance of a pedagogy of contemplation and the idea of the big tent, expanding our tent. Thank you. Uh, for our group, it was the role of uh, the youth being agents in particular to care for creative order and for other aspects of the church and for them to see themselves as church and uh, the importance of dialogue in that process with them and for them to be sort of a suitable process to listen to them and engage them. Uh, the the climate crisis catastrophe was was a priority. Um, the dimensions of how religious education attends to gender and sexuality, and uh, educating for reconciliation relative, especially to polarization in society. Um, I think our group was sort of left to this question, how do we foster in religious education the capacity to listen? And we thought that was important within the Catholic Church, our engagement with other religious traditions, or even polarizing um, perspectives in society. And so we were trying to name ways to be able to foster that as well. Right. Well, thank you very much. We are at the end of our time and we want to respect that uh, for people. So I will ask if there was um, anyone who is not already part of the mailing list for the Catholic Community of Practice and you would like to be, uh, please uh, put your email address in the chat. If you're already on the mailing list, you don't need to do that unless you want to make sure that this group knows who you are and, and uh, can get in touch with you. Um, Mary just put something in uh, about uh, feedback. Is that what that was, Mary? Or yeah, okay. Uh, please, you know, do offer feedback on the session. Um, Chuck and I will be in touch with you about future sessions. Now that we all become virtual, we don't have to wait till next year to be uh, together again. We can find ways to do this uh, in the midst of the year. Um, so uh, now that we have a sense of what you're interested in, we can. Uh, tap you as well to uh, to continue conversation on any of these topics, but uh, please be in touch with us uh, if you would like to further any of this uh, in the meantime. We are so grateful for this time. We are going to stay on. Any of us who would like to stay on, who would like to just chat a little further, uh, are welcome to, but at this time, we're going to close the formal session. Um, great to be with you.